Well, good morning to you, and uh, I am excited today to finish off the book of Galatians, okay? So hopefully uh, you've uh, had an opportunity to look at some of these other chapters, and maybe uh, in time I will be able to go back and revisit chapters one through five. Today we're gonna be looking at chapter six, and, uh, and as we get to this point, uh, I just wanna remind you, the book of Galatians uh, has been called many things. Uh, Leon Morris said this, Galatians is a passionate letter, the outpouring of the soul of a preacher on fire for his Lord and deeply committed to bringing his hearers to an understanding of what saving faith is. Uh, it's also been called the Declaration of Independence of Christian Liberty about the freedom of being a Christian and a Christ follower. Where does it come from? And uh, it's, it's the whole... Uh, message of grace. This is what the whole book of Galatians is about. It's Paul addressing the church in Galatia. Galatia was not a city, it was a region, okay? And uh, it's Paul addressing that whole region. Why? Because he was disappointed that they had turned away from the message that he had brought to them, the message of grace, that you cannot, salvation can never come through works. Your right standing with God can never become through works. It can only be through the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ and the redemptive work of what was achieved on the cross by Jesus. And, uh, and so um, it, it's interesting because uh, Paul basically... Uh, put some parentheses around the whole book of, uh, of Galatians and it starts with grace and it ends with grace and everything about the, the whole book is about grace. And, uh, and so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at Paul's final thoughts, which are represented in Galatians chapter six. So let's read it today. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass or sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of gentle, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So um, after everything that he's gone through, he's, make, he's, he's saying, make sure uh, that you know you always show compassion to people who have fallen. Uh, don't let them be trapped by something and let them stay trapped. Uh, the goal is for not to ignore people. The goal is not to excuse people. The goal is not to destroy people. The goal is always to restore people the same way Jesus restores us to God. So in order for us to, to uh, follow the redemptive work of Christ, we have to always look at restoration in others. And, uh, and, and that's because the church in Galatia, he wanted to make sure after everything that he'd written in the first five chapters, don't forget that grace has to be a part of how you measure this, okay? Um, they had to guard against the temptation of pride. The reason for them falling into where they were is because pride had grabbed a hold of them. And, uh, and, and, and so they, he, he's making, saying, don't, don't, don't fall into that trap, okay? Lest you, that's, because that's a trap you'll fall into. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, the focus is not on expect other people to bear your burdens. That's, that's self-focus, which is just gonna lead right back to pride again, uh, frustration, discouragement, uh, depression. But God always directs us to be others focused, which is bear one another's burdens. And it's a simple command to obey, really. It says, look, look out for your brothers and sisters, and look for anybody who's got a burden and then help them with it. It's not complicated, it's not hard. And you can never excuse yourself because you're going through a tough time that that means you get to ignore the burdens that others are going through. There's, even though we feel totally justified in that, there's nothing biblical about it whatsoever. We feel like, well, but surely when we're going through a tough time, it's okay for us to not look at other people's burdens. No, Paul is saying that just like Jesus, you are always looking to help carry another's burdens. You know, whenever we say, well, I just can't do that right now, you are right. You have forgotten Philippians chapter four. I can only do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So every time you go, well, I just can't do it right now, Pastor, you don't understand. I, no, you're right, but through Christ, you can do it. That's the whole point of what Paul was talking to the church in Galatia. He's giving them a slap. See, uh, bear one another burdens, um, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? A, this is when Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That was in John chapter 13. That's the law of Christ, loving one another. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Um, pride is what prevents us from bearing one another's burdens. Uh, it, it's pride that keeps us from, from helping one another as we should. Because pride is all about a self-focus. Pride doesn't necessarily say, I'm better than you. Pride says, I'm more important than you. That's what it does. So therefore, uh, I deserve more of my own attention and love than you do. You don't deserve my attention and love as much as I deserve my attention and love. You, some of you, you've got to think about this, okay? This is really, this is some really challenging thinking, particularly in the times that we are going through right now, which are very difficult, okay? Because uh, it's out of pride that people will justify not helping other people and they will refuse to help. And, and likewise, it's out of pride that we will refuse to receive help when it's offered to us, when somebody sees our burden. Um, you know, when, when, when Paul says, uh, it, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Um, there are a few things that are uh, more self-deceptive than pride. Uh, because to be proud is to be blind, okay? Uh, blind to the freely given gifts of God that we have in Christ Jesus. Blind to our own sin. Uh, blind to the good in others. Uh, blind to the foolishness uh, of our own self-centeredness. Um, think about this. Do you get angry when somebody deceives you? Um, then you should get angry when you deceive yourself. Because it's a serious and terrible thing to deceive yourself. And that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 4. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoice, rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So we have to examine our own work. Uh, because if we don't, then we can think that our works are approved before God, when really they're not. Okay? Verse 5. For each one shall bear his own load. Okay? Um... If you tie this into verse four, um, there's another aspect to rejoicing in himself. It means by having joy at your own walk with the Lord instead of feeling spiritual because somebody else around you is perhaps overtaken in sin, uh, then that that's the judgment seat that you're sitting in. And when, when, when the Bible says here in verse five, each one shall bear his own load, he's talking about the judgment of Christ at the end of time, Romans 14, um, which is where we will each bear our own load. In other words, we, we will carry what we are responsible for. Um, and there's no contradiction between bearing one another's burdens and then each one shall bear his own load. Uh, because Paul spoke of our final accountability before God, uh, whereas here he's speaking about, or in verse two, he was speaking about our need to care for others in the body of Christ. Okay, so, uh, so they're, they're, they're both relevant to us. Verse six, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Um, now this, this idea here, is, it was awkward for Paul to talk about because it was talking about financial support, but not limited to it. Um, and, and passages like this, they're hard to talk about when you're a preacher. Well, they're not hard. They're just a little awkward because it seems as if you're, you're, you're speaking about something to your own benefit. Um, but the right relationship here that Paul was talking about between the teacher and those who are being taught, uh, the minister and the congregation, if you like, is one of koinonia. That's the Greek word, which is fellowship, partnership. So Paul says, uh, let him who shares the word with you in koinonia, in fellowship, all good things uh, should be shared with him. Uh, it's not payment, it's sharing. Okay, And that's what Paul was talking about. Verse seven, do not be deceived for God is not mocked and whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Um, to regard sharing in all good things with him who teaches as a waste, that is mocking God. That's what Paul's saying. It's selfishness that mocks God's generosity towards those who give to him. Um, and, and the principle of whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. That's a principle that applies beyond giving and supporting teachers and ministers. Uh, it has a general application to life. And we, we can fool ourselves by expecting much when we sow a little, but we cannot fool God. 
and the results of our poor sowing will be evident for every single person to see. This is what Paul's saying to the church. It will be obvious what you've sown because you, what you reap, people can see. Verse eight, for he who sows to his flesh will also of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Think about this, a farmer reaps the same that he has sown. If he plants wheat, wheat comes up, okay? In the same way, if you sow to the flesh, then your flesh will increase. But when we sow to the spirit, even when we sow material things to the spirit, what we reap is not necessarily material things, but something better. It's of the spirit. Of the spirit, we reap everlasting life. This is what Paul's saying. He's saying that the reaping of everlasting life is always greater than any other reaping that you will have in this life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Uh, why? Because the harvest doesn't come immediately after you sow the seeds. You don't sow, a farmer doesn't sow seeds on a Sunday night and then water them and then Monday morning walk out and expect to see a fully grown, you know, a grain of wheat um, or a, a wheat stalk. Um, it, it, and that's why it's easy but dangerous to lose heart. Now, interestingly, the, the, the Greek phrase here used to, to describe the word lose heart was the same kind, uh, was used for the same kind of fear and, uh, and weariness that a woman feels when she's uh, in labor, but she hasn't yet delivered the baby. And it, it describes a time where the work is hard, the work is painful, but it's also unfinished and it's not rewarded yet. And it's easy to lose heart when we feel like that. But that's exactly when you've got to hang on and not grow weary while doing good, knowing what's coming. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay. When Paul wrote, as we have an opportunity and let us do good, he clearly included himself in these words. He spoke to himself here as much as he was speaking to the churches in Galatia. Um, why? Because of the danger brought in by all the legalists, um, Paul's work among them had not yet been fully rewarded. So he needed to remember himself. Don't lose heart, Paul. It's not all over yet. Verse 11. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now, this is a really important point. I love talking about stuff like this. Um, Paul's custom, which was typical in the ancient world, was to dictate his letters to a secretary. But he would often uh, personally write a short portion at the end of his letter to authenticate the letter and add a bit of a personal touch. Um, other examples of this kind of postscript, you can find 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, Colossians chapter 4. Uh, and now, what, now uh, one of the reasons that he may have done this was to prove that it was really him who wrote the letter, which is what he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He said, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. Okay. Um, and then he says, see what large letters. Why did he? he made the letters large for emphasis? And he's saying, I'm emphasizing this closing. So that's why I'm talking about chapter six today, because this is what Paul wrote in large letters. This is what he wanted to emphasize. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Okay, there's a lot wrapped up in this. The legalists that Paul was writing to in, in the region of Galatia, they pretended to be motivated out of concern for the ones that they tried to bring under the law. But Paul saw through all this deception and he saw that their motive was really selfish. It was basically desire to be honored and be glorified in a good showing in their flesh, okay? Um, they wanted, the, 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 the legalists, they wanted the Galatians to become circumcised so that they could um, go around and saying, look, see, they've all submitted to us. They've only been, they've been circumcised because we told them to. Uh, they wanted to wear it as a badge of achievement. And, uh, and when it says here, don't compel somebody to be circumcised, there's nothing wrong with a Gentile being circumcised, but there was everything wrong with compelling a Gentile to be circumcised, saying that he couldn't be right with God unless he came under the law of Moses which was the whole point of the book of Galatians, okay? If, if, if these legalists had have said, 
Um, we are saved only by the work of the cross of Christ, not by our obedience under the law. Then they would have been persecuted, uh, probably by other legalistic Christians and by Jews, those followers of Judaism. And their unwillingness to stand in the face of the pressure made them also stand for false doctrines. Verse 13. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. I mean, he's talking about the hypocrisy of it all. Uh, Paul's heart uh, here is about to be revealed in a very real way. Uh, but God forbid, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul cared nothing for the glory that came from fame. He cared nothing from the glory for the glory that came from riches. He cared nothing for the glory that came from status and power among people. He cared only for the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. And to that I can say, amen. See, uh, Paul consistently said, I've determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He always brought everything back to the glory of the cross, which is an oxymoron to anybody who was reading it. Um, and he's talking about the glorious doctrine of justification and sanctification through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, Paul says, uh, the world can't have any influence over me if I consider myself dead to it. Is that how we live? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. See, what really mattered was not what we do in keeping the law, uh, especially in ceremonies, but it's what God has done in us. It's not what we do, it's what God has done in us, making us a new creation. Um, if you were circumcised, but you weren't a new creation, then you didn't belong to Jesus. But if you were uncircumcised and you were a new creation, you did belong to Jesus. See, we don't make ourselves a new creation. Uh, at its very core, Christianity is something that God does in us, not something we do for God. And, and, and it defines the difference between the system of grace and the system of the law. Verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Um, the, the, the word here, rule, is, is the Greek word canon with a K. And it means a, a, a carpenter or a surveyor's line by which a direction is taken, like a chalk line. Um, and there is a rule for the Christian life. There is a line for us to follow. And it's revealed by God's word. We don't just make it up as we go along. We're to, we have to measure ourselves according to this rule. And... And uh, Paul was willing to give a blessing to those who, were, uh, who would walk according to this rule. Verse 17. From now on, let no one trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote as somebody who had suffered physically for the gospel. He had the marks on his body. If you want to know more about them, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 25. If you want to know what actually happened to him and what physical damage he had in his body. Uh, they, were the, they were what he was talking about, the marks of the Lord Jesus. They weren't similar to Jesus' wounds. They, he's not talking about stigmata, about having the, 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 the same look in his hands and feet. Um, he's talking about the marks that identified him as a Christ follower for the physical beatings that he had taken. That's what he was talking about, which again... If you and I are going to reflect on this, are we, are we going to think about what, what, you know, what have we had to put, what real physical persecutions have we had to endure, um, like the Apostle Paul? And then, of course, we come to uh, the, 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 the wrapping up here. Um, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you in spirit. Paul could wish nothing greater for the church in Galatia and the region of Galatia, then that they would understand grace, that they would walk in a relationship of grace with God instead of a legal performance-based relationship, which just was going to endanger them and their eternity. And, and it's an appropriate end for this letter. And it's an appropriate end for prayer in all of our lives. 
And, and there's so much to observe here. There, there really is, there's so much to observe. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's a great difference between grace and the law. And, and in my, my New King James Study Bible, I'm gonna read to you uh, some of the observations of the difference differences okay so if you've got this bible this might be in yours but it says this you know grace is based on faith the law is based on works grace begins and ends with christ the law makes christ nothing grace is the way of the spirit the law is the spirit is the way of the flesh grace is a blessing the law is a curse Grace is God's desired end for his people. The law was intended only for a means to an end. Grace results in intimacy with Christ. The law results in estrangement and separation from Christ. Grace makes one a son of God and an heir of Christ. The law keeps me a slave. Grace brings liberty and freedom. The law results in bondage. Grace depends on the power of the Holy Spirit. The law depends on my human effort. Grace is motivated by love. The law is motivated by pride. Grace centers on the cross of Jesus Christ and the law centered on circumcision and the things of men. So when I look at what I observe today is that it's all about grace. And is my relationship, I, I, I have to ask myself, and I think you all, we all have to ask ourselves this, is my relationship with Christ performance-based? Because if it is, it can only mean one thing, that I don't understand grace. That's all it can mean. It, it's all it can mean. And if I don't understand grace, I need to read Galatians over and over and over again. I need to study it. I need to study it. I need to understand why Paul was saying what he said to the church in Galatians. You have to understand the book of Galatians shaped the ministry of people like Spurgeon, John Wesley, even Martin Luther. That It was this book that rocked them. That, that, that made them understand the message of Jesus in its simplicity is a grace-filled message. Heavenly Father, we pray today. We pray that God, you would help us to understand your grace. We, I, I pray, Lord, that we would accept your grace. That we'd realize that Nothing we can do can earn our salvation. Nothing we do can make us love, make you love us more. Nothing we do means anything when it comes to the gift of salvation. But God, that your peace is only available to us because of your grace. And your grace is only available to us because of the work of Christ on the cross subsequently rising again from the dead, conquering death. And I pray, Lord, for any person here today, that, Lord, whatever they are facing, I pray, Lord, for all those people who struggle with a performance mindset and they're just trying to, they want to please you, God. It's their heart just to want to please you. They just want to do the right thing by you. But God, I pray, Lord, that they would understand today that to do the right thing by you is just accepting your grace, accepting what it is that you have already done, not what they can do, but what you have already done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.